Good morning. Welcome to Seasons and Colors of the Church Year. Um, we're going to talk about colors more or less next week. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to talk about colors of the church year until you've actually understood, you know, like why do we have these different colors of the church year? But that's not that's another matter. Uh, but today, um, come now. Right. Today we will talk about the calendar of the church year according to the Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church. And so you might want to open up your prayer book and turn to page 15. Uh, and next week we will talk about the tradition of color in the church, uh, investments and hangings. And so um, that sort of makes sense after we've dealt with the whole issue of the, um, the color, uh, of the, the, the calendar of the church year. Um, let's begin at the beginning. Um, the very famous prayer preface to the American Book of Common Prayer um, is part of a larger preface that was written by the Reverend William Smith in 1789. And so every time we have a new prayer book, they reprint the preface to the first American prayer book from 1789, and they reprint the certification of the prayer book saying that this is the prayer book of this church and we expect every member of the church to use it. But the famous preface by the Reverend William Smith is very, very worthwhile to read. And it basically says, hey, there are some things in the church that never change. And then there are some things in the church that can change and do change. Um, and things that don't change are essentially doctrine, doesn't really change. And then things that have to do with discipline namely more or less how we do things in the church, that can change. And of course, what he was responding to is, we had a new book of common prayer in the United States because we had the United States. And so the prayer book of the Church of England of 1662, where you prayed for the king and the royal family, didn't make any sense anymore. And so that was probably the main reason that they created an American prayer book because they didn't want to pray for the king. Um, the Episcopal Church is the American daughter church of the Church of England. Um, and the American prayer book preface by the Reverend William Smith says, this church is far from intending to depart from the Church of England in any essential point of doctrine, discipline, or worship, or further than local circumstances require. So that's really an important thing. By the way, there is this thing that we call the Anglican Communion. They didn't use that term in the 18th century. But the Anglican Communion has 41 provinces or member churches, together with five extra, extra provincial areas, such as Bermuda. The Episcopal Church is the one and only member church of the Anglican Communion in the United States of America. The people that are in a thing called the Anglican Church in North America, that church is not a member church of the Anglican Communion. They have not been admitted as a member church of the Anglican Communion by either the Anglican Consultative Council or the primates. And their bishops, if they come to the Lambeth Conference this summer, they will only, any of their bishops that come, if they are invited, will be invited as observers, okay? So they are, they call themselves Anglican, but, uh, I think that you ought to be part of a church that's a church of the Anglican Communion to call yourself an Anglican. By the way, every province of the Anglican Communion has its own Book of Common Prayer or Book of Liturgy. And our Book of Common Prayer, the first one was in 1789, and then it was revised in 1892. It was revised very lightly in 1928, and it was revised very significantly in 1979. And those years, are the years that General Convention pat, passed the prayer book the second time. And according to Article 10 of the Constitution of the Church, it has to be, we, we, before a new prayer book, you have to have trial use, because we had first, before the first prayer book of this church, we had trial use of the new liturgy, and then it had to be presented to General Convention, and under Article 10, it has to pass General Convention one, a time and then at the subsequent general convention it has to pass again and so we make it 
harder than blue blazes to have a new book of common prayer. And you can complain about that, as I often do, or you can say, hey, it's a good idea that we make it hard so that for the, for the reason that we don't really want to have a new revision every 10 years, right? Turn to page 13 on the prayer book. And it says, the first sentence, the first sentence on page 13 says this, the Holy Eucharist, the principal act of Christian worship on the Lord's Day and other major feasts. So that makes it clear that the Eucharist is, in fact, the principal act of Christian worship on the Lord's Day and other major feasts. And then, together with daily morning and evening prayer are not the principal act of Christian worship. As set forth in, these, in this book, they are the regular services appointed for public worship in this church. Uh, the old prayer book of 1928 had a daily lectionary and morning and evening prayer were called daily morning prayer and daily evening prayer, as they are called in this book. And then there was a Sunday lectionary for the Eucharist, uh, but there was a daily lectionary for morning and evening prayer. And also, morning prayer did not have anything in it like an offertory or a final blessing. So if you, th <laughs> if you think that there should be an offering taken up in church, to pay the expenses of the church, and if you think there should be a final blessing at the end of a service, then um, all of that stuff was more or less added later, or added to morning prayer services, because it was never, it's never been in the prayer book that you had an offertory and a final blessing, except in this prayer book. So it was actually not a change to say that the Eucharist is the principal act of Christian worship on the Lord's Day, but this prayer book made it explicit. Now, what happens if you are in a parish that does not have a priest? Well, then you can't have a Eucharist, okay? And so the norm, traditionally, has been that every Christian congregation has a priest or a bishop, and so that priest or bishop presides at the Holy Eucharist. If your Christian community, your parish, your mission church, your chaplaincy, your whatever, your congregation does not have a priest, then the norm cannot really be that you have a Eucharist. That doesn't mean that morning prayer or evening prayer is somehow second class, but the normative worship of the church when you have a congregation with a priest is that you would celebrate a Eucharist um, according to this prayer book. And so the other thing is, uh, and I'm quoting on page 13, paragraph 4, in all services, the entire Christian assembly participates in such a way that the members of each order within the church, note who's mentioned first, laypersons, bishops, priests, and deacons, fulfill the functions proper to their respective orders as set forth in the rubrical directions for each service. By the way, rubrics used to be printed in red. And that's why they were called rubrics, because they were printed in red. We, it's hard to find a prayer book with rubrics printed in red. The prayer book we have up at the altar, the rubrics are in red. And so we still call them rubrics, but they're in small print or italic print, and we still call them rubrics, even though they're not really in red. Anyway, by the way, you may have wanted to know what a fair linen is. Let me tell you what a fair linen is or was. In this prayer book, on page 406, the holy table is spread with a clean white cloth during the celebration, in the celebration of the Eucharist, a clean white cloth. In the older prayer books of 1928 and previously, it said that this, the holy table was to be spread with a fair linen cloth. And that is why we still, in Anglicanism, probably still use the term fair linen. Other churches call it an altar cloth, and we, I think, still call it a fair linen. But it doesn't have to be linen anymore. And I hate to tell you this, it's okay to have vestments and linens in the church that are not sewn or embroidered by hands, by hand. And that is not the way it was understood 80 or 100 years ago. Everything you used 
had to be embroidered by hand, uh, as I was told when I was a young priest. But anyway, it can be linen, it can be polyester, I don't care. You can use a machine to sew the embroidery on, to hem it, whatever, but you don't have to do it by hand anymore. By the way, a fair linen has five crosses usually, or it's supposed to, traditionally. Uh, the cross in the center, and over that cross, that's where the Holy Eucharist is consecrated, right? And then at the edges, you have the four horns of, horns of the altar, and there's a cross in each of the horns as well as in the middle. And these are traditional and they are optional. Okay, another thing that is different that you may not know is that on page 298 of this prayer book, it says, Holy baptism is full initiation, full initiation by water and the Holy Spirit into Christ's body, the church. The bond which God establishes in baptism is indissoluble. And so when you are baptized, even if you are a little baby, you have been fully initiated by water and the Holy Spirit into Christ's body, the church. There's actually not even a, a canon law that says vestry members have to be confirmed. And the big books that we record people in, it used to have a section that was called communicants. And now if you buy one of those big parish registers, it doesn't say communicants anymore, it says baptized persons. And so when a, because the term communicant, since this prayer book, a communicant is a baptized person because you, you do not have to be confirmed to receive communion. So that's a big difference from the old prayer book. By the way, in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, Paul introduces the concept of the church as the body of Christ. And in Romans 6, Paul links baptism and the death and resurrection of Christ. And I would also tell you that no matter what day or season of the church year it may be, God loves you and God wants the best for you, okay? Now, we are all familiar with the fact that sometimes in human life are more joyful than others. We're all familiar with the fact that there are some days that one cannot help but celebrating. Other days are days of sorrow for any number of reasons. And most days are somewhere in between extreme joy and extreme sorrow. And the Christian year is like that. It would be unrealistic to ex celebrate extreme joy every day of the year. And it would be even worse, I think, to observe sorrow every single day of the year. Now, over many centuries, the calendar of the church year has developed over a long period of time. Liturgical books, like the prayer book, are snapshots of how Christian worship is done in the church. There is no single liturgical book, such as the Book of Common Prayer, that will never change. All liturgical books, which are used by living churches, are subject to growth and transformation. I mean, the first prayer book was 1549, and the next prayer book was 1552, okay? And then that one didn't last long because Queen Mary became the queen. Um, and the person that wrote the first two prayer books was, was put to death. But anyway, I have personally used the prayer books of 1928, 1979, of 1995, which is in the Church of the Province of the West Indies, along with the Green Book, Services for Trial Use, the Zebra Book, um, Authorized Services 73, and when I went to seminary, we had a blue book, which would not, the cover would not stay closed, it was one of those plastic type things, and it was called the Draft Proposed Book of Common Prayer, and that is what went to General Convention in 1976, okay? Now, in the calendar of the church year, there are two cycles to be celebrated. The first cycle is the Sunday cycle, it consists of Sundays and other holy days that we celebrate, such as the most important day of all, Easter Day, and then Christmas Day, Epiphany, the Sundays in Lent, and the Sundays after Pentecost. Most of these days, other than Christmas, which is always December 25th, and Epiphany, which is always January the 6th, most of these days vary from year to year because they are based on the dates for Easter Day and other Sundays. And the other cycle is the sanctoral cycle, meaning the cycle of saints' days. And saints' days are celebrated on fixed days 
in the calendar. I was ordained to the priesthood on December the 5th, which is the feast of St. Clement of Alexandria. Um, some of you have heard of St. Luke, and his day is October, 11th, or October 18th. Some of you have heard of Holy Cross Day, and that's September 14th. Some of you have heard of the con conversion of Paul the Apostle, which is um, January 25th. And some of you have heard of the confession of Peter, which is January 18th. So anyway, saints' days and holy days, saints' days are usually on a fixed day. If they fall on a Sunday, they're transferred to the next day. Easter day is the first Sunday after the full moon that falls on or after the spring equinox, which is March 21st. And so Easter cannot occur before March 22nd or after April 25th. The dates of Easter day are found in the back of the prayer book. And the first Eucharist of Easter is a day called Easter Eve at the Great Vigil of Easter. And there are to a total of seven Sundays of Easter. Actually, there are eight Sundays in Easter, and the eighth Sunday of Easter is the day of Pentecost. Okay? And so counting Easter day through the day of Pentecost, the Easter season is known as the Great 50 Days. And during these 50 days, we burn the Paschal Candle because the Paschal Candle celebrates and symbolizes for us the presence of the risen Christ. And that's also the reason that we burn the Paschal Candle at funerals and at baptisms, because the Paschal Candle symbolizes the presence of the risen Christ in the church, okay? In this prayer book, there are seven principal feasts. The highest ranking is Easter Day, uh, and then the other three are based on Easter. Ascension Day is 40 days after Easter. Pentecost is uh, also a Sunday and it's 50 days after Easter. Trinity Sunday is the Sunday after the day of Pentecost. And then three days are days that if they fall on a Sunday, it, bounce, it, it, it knocks out the Sunday. If All Saints Day falls on a Sunday, November 1st, then you don't celebrate the Sunday, you celebrate All Saints Day. And in the Episcopal Church, we are allowed to celebrate All Saints Day on the Sunday following as well. Christmas Day is December 5th, whether it's a Sunday or not. Epiphany is January the 6th, whether it's a Sunday or not. Sundays are important because all Sundays of the year are feasts of our Lord Jesus Christ. And since Jesus outranks all of the saints or outranks any particular saint, then if a saint's day falls on a Sunday, a saint's day other than All Saints Day, if it's a saint's day that falls on a Sunday, the Sunday takes precedence because the Sundays are feasts of our Lord. And three feasts in addition to All Saints Day, Christmas and Epiphany take precedence of a Sunday. The holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus got a name on January the 1st. In the old prayer book, it was the Feast of the Circumcision. Um, it, the prayer presentation of Christ the Lord in the temple is February 2nd, uh, and the transfiguration is August the 6th. So if August the 6th falls on a Sunday, you don't celebrate the Sunday after Pentecost, you celebrate transfiguration. Other holy days um, uh, I've mentioned, uh, the Annunciation is exactly nine months before Christmas Day for obvious reasons. Uh, the visitation of the Virgin Mary to St. Elizabeth is May 31st. St. John the Baptist, uh, which accord, who according to Luke, though not any other gospel, John the Baptist is sort of a, of a, a distant cousin of Jesus. Uh, the nativity of St. John the Baptist is June the 24th, and I was confirmed on that day. Transfiguration is August the 6th, and Holy Cross is September 14th. And other major feasts, well, all apostles are major feasts. All of the evangelists, yes, two of them are apostles. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the evangelists, right? St. Stephen is a New Testament saint, and his day is December 26th. The Holy Innocents is one of those days after Christmas. Uh, St. Joseph, um, the, um, the earthly father of our Lord, um, is a major feast. St. Mary the Virgin on August 15th is a major feast. St. Michael and All Angels on September 29th is a major feast. St. James of Jerusalem, 
whom St. Paul calls the brother of the Lord. Uh, he's a major feast. And we have two major feasts that are not really church feasts, but they are national feasts. And that is Independence Day and Thanksgiving Day. And we have always had a collect epistle and gospel, namely a proper for Independence Day and Thanksgiving Day. There are other days of special devotion that are called fasts. The two days of fasting are Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Um, and then all the Fridays of the year, except for Fridays in the Christmas and Easter seasons, and any other feasts of our Lord which occur on a Friday, are days of special devotion. What is a day of special devotion? Well, traditionally, on Fridays, you don't eat meat, right? Uh, that is not a fast, that is abstinence, but you don't eat meat on Fridays. Uh, and Episcopalians used to observe this. Uh, and uh, this prayer book doesn't tell you what you're supposed to do to observe the special acts of discipline and self-denial. It could mean you visit people in a nursing home, you say special prayers. And so if you look on this calendar page, everybody got a calendar page? We have some of these. And look on, look on, um, look on uh, June the 10th, June the 17th, and June the 24th. And I also have it on the screen. If you look on June the 10th, June 17th, and June the 24th, you see in the left upper corner of each of these days, uh, this is May, let me give you June. If you look on there, on that left upper corner of each day, the 10th, the 17th, and the 24th, there is that cross. And that cross is telling you, and it says somewhere on the calendar, that is telling you it's a day of special devotion. And you can see we're not got, we don't have one on June the 3rd because we're still in the season of Easter. So if you're in the great 50 days, you don't observe abstinence on Friday or whatever it is you do, see? So days of special devotion uh, that you see that little cross on the calendar, either on the Episcopal Church guide that I have up there or the Ordo calendar, which we have here at church, that little cross is, means it's a day of special enough devotion. And uh, any time like between Christmas and Epiphany, you would not see that cross. And during the 50 days of Easter, you would not see that cross. However, you would see that cross on all the weekdays of Lent, not Sundays. Why? Because Sundays are a feast of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we count, when we count the 40 days of Lent, we only count the weekdays of Fort Lent. And that's why we don't say such and such is a Sunday of Lent. We say that it's a Sunday in Lent. Because if you are in Lent, if it's a Sunday, it's a feast of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, it cannot be a fast. How about that? By the way, if it's a major holy day, you have to say the creed at the Eucharist. If it's not a major holy day on a weekday, you don't have to say the creed. Okay? Um, now, if you look on page 31 to 33, you will see that there are the titles of the seasons and major holy days. Look on page 31, and you can see the first Sunday of Advent, the second Sunday of Advent, and so forth. You'll see the official title of Christmas, the Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christmas Day. <coughs> There's always one Sunday after Christmas, right? And then January the 1st, no matter when it falls, is Holy Name Day. It's a major feast. And then the second Sunday after Christmas, you can have as many as two Sundays after Christmas, or you can have just one. It depends on when January the 6th falls. When January the 6th comes, it's no longer in the season of Christmas. The Epiphany is January the 6th. The first Sunday after the Epiphany, we celebrate the baptism of Jesus. And then the second Sunday through the eighth Sunday after the Epiphany, our Sundays after Epiphany, you can have as many as nine Sundays after Epiphany. In which case, no matter how many Sundays after Epiphany there are, the last Sunday after Epiphany is called the last Sunday after the Epiphany. 
and on one or two of the Sundays in year A, B, or C, you will have the proper for the transfiguration, okay? Now, the Easter season has Easter Day, and the second Sunday of Easter through the seventh Sunday. The last Sunday and the last day of the Easter season is the day of Pentecost. During all the days of the Easter season, other than the day of Pentecost, white is the liturgical color. Colorful tapestry or gold may also be used to signify the joy of the Easter season. Um, Vicki has my ordination chasuble and it's off-white. Off-white is better than white for white vestments actually because they get dirty. But uh, it has tapestry around the shoulders and down the front. It's called a paleomorphy, and it's very colorful. And that, that's what I use sometimes, uh, and that is considered a white chasuble. By the way, in the season of Easter, we have, when we say Compline, before and after the Nunc Dimittis, you say, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according. And at the very end of the Nunc Dimittis, you say, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. And that is in the season of Easter. See, we just said it the other day. And then in the Eucharist, at the very end, the double Alleluias are said. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia. And the people respond, thanks be to God. Alleluia, Alleluia. And so they are not said at any other time of the year other than the season of Easter. Some Episcopalians can't read the rubrics, I guess. And some priests can't read the rubrics. But nonetheless, if you went to Seabury Western, you would have learned to read the rubrics. Anyway, the Paschal candle <coughs> burns at all services from Easter Day through the day of Pentecost. Previously, people extinguished the Paschal candle on the, after the Gospel at the Ascension since after the gospel of the ascension, the idea is Jesus isn't with us anymore because he's ascended into heaven. But in this prayer book, it says, it is customary that the Paschal candle burn at all services from Easter day through the day of Pentecost. This prayer book does not emphasize days as much as it emphasizes seasons, okay? In the Easter season, there are a bunch of Sundays. We're at the fifth Sunday of Easter today. The Advent season always has four Sundays. By the way, the first Sunday of Advent is always the Sunday closest to St. Andrew's Day, which is November 30th. The Christmas season has 12 days. Um, the Epiphany season can have as many as nine Sundays, and that means that Easter is just as late as it can be. Um, the Lenten season has six Sundays, if you include Holy Week as part of Lent, which I think we do. Not everyone agrees. But there are five Sundays in Lent plus Palm Sunday. Holy Week is Palm Sunday through the morning of Saturday of Holy Week. In the evening of Saturday of Holy Week, it's not Holy Week anymore. It's Easter Eve. See? Um, and then the season after Pentecost can have as many as 27 Sundays after Pentecost. And that would mean Easter is very, very early. See? In the seasons of the church year, there are a couple of seasons which are not so much joyful as they are penitential. And one of the problems or one of the questions that people have is just how penitential Advent is supposed to be. Um, we all know that Lent and especially Holy Week are very, very penitential. We're sorry for our sins. Um, and Advent seems to be less penitential than Lent. You can still use Alleluia before the, uh, you know, at the breaking of the bread. Christ our Pass, Alleluia, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, Alleluia. The only time you don't use that is during Lent. Uh, we've already talked about Lent being as penitential as it is. Uh, the two penitential seasons of Lent and Advent precede the two most joyful seasons, namely Easter and Christmas. And the idea is the penitence that we experience or maybe experience in the season of Advent is supposed to prepare our hearts for the high levels of joy at Easter and Christmas. Um, traditionally, we have an Advent wreath which is round usually. There are some that are not round. 
But anyway, uh, you light the first candle on the first Sunday of Advent, which is sometimes called Advent Sunday, and you keep lighting them so that on the fourth Sunday of Advent, you've got four uh, candles. Traditionally, before we were as lectionary bound or lectionary oriented as we are now, the clergy were expected to preach sermons on the four last things, death, judgment, hell, and heaven. By the way, a sermon can be about anything, and I mean anything, whereas a homily is a type of sermon which is based on the lessons that you have read that day in that liturgy. And so a homily is a type of sermon. It does not necessarily mean a shorter sermon. Um, and in the Episcopal prayer book, we, it says at funerals, the homily may follow. And they use the term homily because they're trying to get Episcopalians to get away from eulogies, which don't necessarily really have the, any place in a liturgical funeral. Um, I, think a, I think a eulogy is okay after the post-communion prayer and before the final commendation. But unfortunately, and if you've seen some funerals of politicians or their wives recently, it's like the eulogy takes over the, the funeral service. And that is clearly not what it's supposed to be. By the way, in the Sarum use, Sarum is the Latin word for Salisbury. And the Sarum use was very influential on um, Archbishop Cranmer as he put together the first prayer book. Um, and in the Sarum use, they used blue vestments rather than purple vestments for, um, for Advent. And in the calendar of the church here, there are major holy days. And these used to be called red letter days because not the liturgical color of the day, but when the calendar was printed, the title of the day would be printed in red letters if it had a collect epistle and gospel in the back of the prayer book. In the old prayer book, you had the King James Version, I'm sorry to say, had the epistle and gospel, you didn't have an Old Testament lesson, and then you had the collect all in this um, quasi-Elizabethan language. Um, and if it was a prayer book holy day, if it, had a if it had the collect epistle and gospel printed in the prayer book, it was called a prayer book holy day or frequently called a red letter day. And then later in the 60s, um, the uh, low churchmen blocked having a bunch of other feasts in the calendar that were not in the uh, New Testament people. And so uh, it was allowed that we would have another book that's called Lesser Feasts and Fasts, which goes back to around 1963. And that gave you a collect epistle and gospel for all of these other people who are saints. Uh, if you look in the calendar of the church here, you see some of them that are in bold print. Those are red letter days. Those are major holy days. And the ones that are in regular print during the days of each of the months, those are called black letter days because they were printed in black letters. And they did not have a collect epistle and gospel in the prayer book. And so you had to use either the Sunday proper. Um, you can always use the Sunday, the Sunday proper from the previous Sunday or you use something called the Common of Saints. And so, uh, if you look at the calendar of all the Holy Days printed on pages 19 through 30 in the prayer book, the major Holy Days, in other words, the red letter days, are indicated by bold face types. Uh, and if most of these Holy Days, the bold face type or red letter days, fall on a Sunday, you, the major ones are transferred to the next open day, like Monday. There is no provision in this prayer book for transferring the minor holy days, although there is no provision in the prayer book that says you cannot do so. And so in our next session, we will study the vestments that are used um, uh, and also the colors that are used.